There are 103 words written in English down there on the right about this statue. Not one, not once does the word Ulster occur. C.S. Lewis was outraged when this particular statue, which had nothing to do with Southern unificationist separatism, was virtually stolen by de Valera and uh, dedicated to a quite different cause. This was the hero of Ulster, the Christ figure of Ulster. He represented the transpartitionism of Finn McCool, because while, of course, the North and the South, the Bavaria and the Austria of this island are both parts of the one nation, they're not necessarily one state. And the Luther line that runs from Dresden to Sacramento passes mysteriously across this island. The Cullen's job was to defend this particular dialect. In fact, the poem, which means the raid, is simply a description of the god of the south attacking the god of the north in the form of two bulls. This is the whole of Latin attacking the whole of Nordic civilization. And that's why Hitler, a southern Catholic nationalist, had been beaten back across that line. The Japs, as a pretty Catholics of the Far East, they'd be beaten north of that line in the Southern Hemisphere. And so the equilibrium of yin and yang restored. Irish nationalism, which seeks to destroy the border, seeks to destroy the sanity inside the whole of Western Europe. Because the left side of Western Europe's brain must be independent of the right-hand side. If it were not for the thin orange line, in the third month of 1941, the North Atlantic Bridge would have collapsed and a hundred million Russians would have died in three successive winter famines. From in here, the gas chamber where James Connolly was suffocated to death, and Patrick Pierce, who wrote that marvelous essay referring to the army of the Four Nations as the Navy as our Navy, and the Christian brother roared at him and signed his death warrant by humiliating him in front of the class, and Pierce spent the rest of his life to satisfy that brother and came in here to die also in the gas chamber. When we look out here and see that orange man marching just beyond Cucullin as the goddess perches on his shoulder, I think to myself, Supreme Commander John McMichael of the UDA and Ray Smallwood, they have The orange men are walking still, right in front of the two people. This again is James Joyce, uh, the great artist of Southern Europe, Becker, the great artist of Northern Europe, contrasted like the two cathedrals in one. The rich, um, Baroque South and the stern Nordic North. Jokax, uh, his name came from the French word for joints. And uh, a man who in Ulysses celebrated the sunset of the largest and the least undemocratic empire that had ever existed. Reminds us of a month later, Edward VII stepped off the train at the North Station in Waterford to receive the loyal uh, address of all the trade unions. And John Redmond recalls how tens of millions of Irish people would not live abroad but for the existence of the British Irish Empire. I do think Ulysses celebrates the glories of a multinational empire, its superiority to the Serbo-Nazi bullshit that killed 40 million people shortly after. Not to speak of orphan people. Molly Bloom, something that Joyce just a few feet from the GPO would have celebrated. Not the death wish, but the life wish. Right close up, come on. Close up. Like I said, this is pretty much the life wish, or at least life mother sir. This is possibly the most beautiful parliament building in the world. Not some kind of Gaelic parliament. The first and the last Gaelic proto-parliament was called only for the top half of the island, significantly enough. This particular parliament represents the current stage in the making of the Irish nation. So of course we're a sort of a 
Cree culture island. What do you think? Shut up. No, no. Yeah. A last shot of the front of Trinity College. A book, a, a, a building apparently of some Germanic inspiration, but uh, impressive nonetheless. Not quite as beautiful and as feminine as the building behind us. Now, are you going? Yeah. We're looking now at the College Green Irish Parliament building. In 1782 up until 1801, this was a completely autochthonous parliament. That means it had a constitution self born from its own soil. The Chief Justice once said, Chief Justice was given, we now have the right, he said, to declare His Holiness the Pope, King of Ireland. But is this safe? He said. Those beautiful Parliament buildings became defunct in 1801 and were thought this was a tragedy. But was it a tragedy? Not according to Edmund Burke. Let's go inside for a man with a Catholic heart, but a Protestant mind. Yeah, keep going. It's good. Hang on. Yeah. Uh, and he opened the gap, yeah? Here he is. Edmund Burke, the man himself. Possibly born in Waterford, but probably in Dublin. Catholic heart, Protestant mind, Catholic convert on his deathbed, but thanks be to God, always a Protestant in his intellect. This man was virtually certain he foretold the rebellion in Haiti, foretold that French Stalinism would become Stalinism and both and the heads of state, both the king and queen, would be executed. Uh, foretold 1798 and said it would remove the junta, he said to Bishop Husky of Waterford, and produce good results, an act of union. But surely the act of union is terrible. Who says the act of union is terrible? We'll find out when we get to Trafalgar. Now Trafalgar, of course, is Nelson. Oh, you know. yeah. Nelson's pillar one stood somewhere around here, the very centre of the second city of the empire, the seventh city of Christendom. Within 18 months of Trafalgar, the first universal parliament came into existence, and the first universal law was passed, abolishing the slave trade over every square foot of the earth's surface. America quickly caved in, sick of having its ship, ships confiscated, and soon two wooden walls of Anglo-Saxon ships uh, came right down the west coast of Africa and strangled that slave trade. As late as 1898, the Vatican was able to announce, in the teenage years of James Joyce, that slavery for Catholics was not a moral question, but a political question. As late as 1958 was the last article defending slavery ever written by a Catholic theologian. The man, by the way, who persuaded uh, Pope Paul VI to attack artificial birth control. 